Hello and welcome. My name is Ogale Odo, and I thank you for joining us today in a discussion about Haiti. I am USAID Haiti's acting mission director, and I reside in Port-au-Prince, the capital of Haiti. Now, the US Agency for International Development is the US government's entity that delivers taxpayer-funded aid to Haiti and other less developed countries around the world. And as a foreign diplomat, I work out of the US embassy in Haiti, where our agency is one of many within the embassy. Now, you may, not, you may know this already, but I just I like repeating it. USAID is the premier international development agency of the United States government. We had one of the legs in the three-legged stool, that is the US foreign policy approach. That's the development leg. The other legs of this stool are diplomacy, headed by the US State Department, and defense headed by the military. Now in over 60 years of our existence, our primary mission has been to reduce poverty across the globe. But more recently, like many others in the development community, we realized that the world could end extreme poverty and that we could see this happen in our lifetime. And so we revised our mission to partner to end extreme poverty. And to, advise, and to advance security and prosperity in the, United, in the United States and across the world. And one of our most important takeaways from our experience in development in the past 50 years or so is that we cannot solve these problems in the developing countries alone. We've learned the limits of our influence. But what do I mean by that? In all the time that we've practiced development, We've learned that true, positive, and effective or lasting change only occurs when we stand shoulder to shoulder with the recipient country and with other stakeholders to propose and to implement solutions. It occurs when we work with those who understand the local context, the culture, the language, and the history of the places where we work. And I must add that in places like Haiti, we we have to work with those who are able to capture lessons learned from one context or one country and who are able and willing to put in the work to replicate those successes from those other contexts and those countries. People like you. Now, my focus today will be on this Caribbean island that is a short two hour flight away from Miami. However, I encourage you to think about Haiti in the context of other less developed countries with equally challenging operating environments. Places like Haiti, which for whatever reason, face daunting challenges. I will highlight the recent events that have occurred in Haiti that now pose additional challenges to this country's future development. But as you must know, there is great opportunity in every crisis. Our objective today is to reveal that there is a role for impact investors in Haiti and in less developed, developed countries like this. I believe that your creative solutions over the long run could and indeed would help SMEs grow and help Haiti to chart a new, a new course. Let me talk about the early context for a, for a minute. I'll begin by providing some basic context about this country to be certain. Haiti is a wonderful country with a vibrant culture, resilient people, and as Caribbean islands go, it is one of the much larger uh, countries. Now, Haiti became the first country in the world to be led by former slaves after declaring its independence in 1804. Now, over the last two centuries, Haiti met more than its share of challenges. Immediately following its independence, the country was churned internationally and heavily indebted. Now, overall, this country has endured various periods of hardship, and today its poverty is striking. As you may recall, in January 2010, a massive magnitude 7.0 earthquake struck this country. Its epicenter was only about 25 kilometers or 15 miles west of the capital of Port-au-Prince. That earthquake killed more than 300,000 people and left more than 1.5 million people homeless. 
it was that earthquake was assessed as one of the worst that had occurred in this region in the last 200 years. Now, following that, in October 2016, disaster struck this tiny island, this island again, or this part of the island again, when Hurricane Matthew made landfall in the southern part of the country. Now, this resulted in over 500 deaths and caused extensive damage to crops, houses, livestock, and infrastructure. Now, since 2018, the security in Haiti has been deteriorating. It's gang violence. There's a gang violence crisis that dominates life in Port-au-Prince. It is taking a heavy toll on the Haitian people and greatly impacts business at almost every level. In addition, Haiti has long been unable to deliver adequate social infrastructure and public goods to its people. And just this summer, there's been a wave of calamities. In July, President Juvenile Moïse was assassinated in his residence. On August 14, a magnitude 7.2 earthquake struck the southern part of southwestern part of the country, killing more than 2,000 people and injuring more than 12,000 others. It destroyed, destroyed a lot of houses, schools, and basic infrastructure. And now on September 27, another crisis is brewed, which many of you may have, know, may have noticed. On the US-Mexico border in Texas, there, are thousands, there were thousands of Haitian migrants that arrived there in waves. Now, despite this dire situation that I have painted, there is great opportunity in Haiti. I would venture to say that in Haiti, the social returns on investment are some of the highest in the world. The marginal benefit to investing $1 in Haiti is truly tremendous. And the impact investing community combined with philanthropy and entrepreneurship can do great things together with us in development. Like elsewhere in the world, small businesses in Haiti struggle to access capital from local financiers, particularly nowadays when commercial banks are rightfully, I suppose, in capital preservation mode. Now, in places like Haiti, few non-bank financial institutions exist, which means the depth of capital solutions has been shallow. Now, furthermore, there are small and medium-sized enterprises that are unable to obtain risk capital from local lenders and are also not the typical recipient of foreign aid. Now, rather than tell you about the missing middle, though, which is a familiar story across the, the globe, I'd like to simply highlight an alternative approach to investing in this country. The alternative of identifying a development problem and building financing structures around that solution, as opposed to the more typical approach of identifying broad opportunities for wholesale lending via local financial institutions, which could accelerate impact. So what do I mean by that? Take, for example, the infamous problem of deforestation in Haiti, which is largely due to a tremendous demand for charcoal, but also partly due to its geography. Now, the charcoal is used for cooking. Now, on one hand, the production of charcoal is a major economic livelihood for rural Haitians. And on the other hand, charcoal is a driver of deforestation and environmental degradation. USAID and other donors have sought to address this problem through various means. But what I want to highlight today is our partnership with local businesses that sell gas stoves and solar stoves as an alternative. The value chain for selling non-wood stoves is complex and to create markets that help Haitians shift from charcoal to alternatives such as gas or solar stoves require developing creative financial schemes. In this case, working with local lender, lending cooperative societies to create financing options that enable Haitians to purchase, purchase the stoves in installments, that has been critical for us. No doubt, this approach takes more time and effort. And there, and maybe there's a role here for the more patient capital providers, such as philanthropists, to first develop the solution and impact investors to provide the financial capital. Now, starting small in Haiti could lead to other opportunities as well. Finding a solution to one problem will lead to the discovery of other opportunities, that's for sure. Now, maybe there is a limited supply of gas to operate the new stoves and finance is required to expand access to gas or to look at various opportunities to develop alternative source of, sources of energy. 
Or maybe while analyzing the supply of gas, you identify a gap in social infrastructure, such as transportation and roads. Another unique investment play in Haiti could be to work with local government to understand where and how the private sector provides public services. As I mentioned previously, Haitians are a resilient people. And where the government has failed to provide services or has been unable to provide services, you can bank on a Haitian somewhere developing a private sector-led solution. No doubt, solving these complex problems takes time and money. We believe, however, that there's a unique role for each of you and that making the effort will be worth it for you and for your stakeholders. We hope you will join us in the following panel discussion where we'll explore with our social our special guests how external capital can be deployed in Haiti, even in today's tough environment. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ogale Odo and I welcome you to this panel discussion regarding investing in, in Haiti. Uh, we have an esteemed panel with us today, which I would like to introduce, starting with uh, Jean-Marc Cuvilli from DAI, who leads a USAID Haiti technical assistance program called Haiti Invest. We have Tony Moise, who is the Director General of Haiti's Development Bank, SOFIT. Uh, we have Robert Pahre Jr., who is the Chairman and CEO of Profan, uh, Haiti's only investment bank. And of course, we have Andy Heskowitz, who has joined us from USA, from US Development Finance Corporation, where he is the Chief Development Officer. Now, uh, this is a, a great opportunity in Haiti, and you know the social returns on investments at this time are perhaps some of the the highest in the world. And you know, the marginal benefit to investing, say, a dollar in Haiti is, is from what I hear, is, is tremendous. And you know, the impact investing community combined with philanthropy and entrepreneurship can, can really do great things here. This is what we believe. So like elsewhere in the world, small businesses in Haiti struggle to, to access capital from local financiers. Uh, but today we will tackle three subjects, which include one, the challenges of doing business in Haiti, uh, two, the specific challenges that insecurity poses in, in Haiti, and lastly, the investment of opportunities in this country. We we'll would like to encourage you, our distinguished panelists and the audience, to think about how this discussion applies to other least development, least developed countries. Now, uh, I would like to start with you, Jean-Marc, if you do not, uh, if you have a minute. Uh, USAID Haiti developed a program whereby we hire transaction advisors who over the last few years helped SMEs successfully close millions in financing with local and international investors. Can you start off, Jean-Marc, by uh, giving some context and, and sharing an example with us, for instance? What were the primary constraints that you know, companies faced prior to successfully raising capital? Sure, sure. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for, for having me and allowing me to participate uh, in this panel. Um, well, the, the Haiti Invest platform is um, a different way to tackle the, the difficulty in uh, raising capital in a challenging environment. Um, what we see in Haiti is that there are a number of uh, strong firms that have, uh, or, and strong entrepreneurs, I should say, that um, simply don't have the resources, the know-how, the time uh, to secure, find the sources of capital that they need and uh, and grow, expand their businesses in a way that the local economy desperately needs. And so what we structured through Haiti Invest 
is essentially a way of supporting what we would call um, middlemen or, or, or transaction advisors that um, are tasked with identifying those businesses that are in need of capital um, and then doing all the work that's necessary for uh, preparing them and making them stronger, more competitive uh, within the, the capital market, the, both local and, um, and potentially overseas, and then securing those, uh, those sources of capital and closing the deals. Um, so over the last uh, close to three and a half years, we have worked with seven such transaction advisors, uh, all local firms um, that have uh, deep roots uh, in the country and know, um, have contacts uh, with the small and, the small and medium business uh, enterprises. And um, we've really partnered with them and provided them financial incentives to close transactions. Um, despite the challenging environment, I think that the results have been very promising to us. Um, in total, we gave out about $1.9 million in, uh, in incentive capital. Um, and these transaction advisors have been able to secure, uh, to date, roughly 19, over 19 million um, in financing for 11, um, 11 SMEs. Um, there is currently another 3 million waiting to be closed, and they have an additional pipeline of 10 million. So just on um, just on the capital that's closed already, we've seen uh, ten times uh, our multiple, if you will, multiple invested uh, of roughly ten times, turning one point nine million of of uh, U.S. aid uh, capital into nineteen million dollars of investment. And the and we've worked with a, a gamut of uh, of businesses. Um, ranging in all sectors of the economy, manufacturing, um, hospitality, energy, um, agriculture. So it's, it's really ranged. And if you look at um, the size of the deals that we've done, the average deal is roughly 1.7 million, but that's a bit skewed because some transactions, there's, there are a couple of transactions that are on the large side. But, it, but the median transaction is roughly 330000 So you're really looking at businesses that are, um, in general, accessing uh, bank financing, um, quite a bit of uh, uh, what we would uh, qualify as uh, um, sometimes philanthropies that are doing, um, that are doing private investments, um, we're seeing a lot of this type of development capital, whether it's from um, DFIs or other such organizations. So it, it, it really runs, um, runs the gamut. And as I said, so far, we've closed on 11 such businesses. Um, I can give you an example of one uh, business that we did during the, just at the start of the COVID pandemic. This was a, um, a producer of cleaning products that wanted to build up their inventory of uh, uh, as the pandemic was starting to take hold in in Europe and before it had really um, arrived in Haiti, and they were able to secure uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars from a local bank in order to build up uh, their inventory and prepare um, prepare themselves for the the additional. Um, needs that that they were seeing in Haiti. Um, we've worked with a uh, and on the agricultural side, we've worked with a business that um, uh, basically works with local farmers to get their products to overseas market. Uh, they received um, uh, 
a loan from a development organization that's been operating in Haiti for a long time. So again, these, these are the businesses that have been entrenched in Haiti for a while, but have had difficulties in accessing uh, this type of capital. Let, let me move on to to Rawapari, for, for instance, because I know you have some some great experience um, as the president of its first and only investment bank. Again, I want to thank you for for joining us. Um, you, you know, I understand that your business involves developing capital markets and creating opportunities for institutional and retail investors alike. How, however. On the investment side of your business, you know, investing in Haitian SMEs, what unique advantage do local investors have? You know, and, and, and you know, how do you think it's possible for external investors to navigate these challenging waters? Well, um, let me start by saying that I'm a former commercial banker. I spent over 20 years in the commercial banking world, most of that time in the credit field, which gave me uh, enough time to measure what are the challenges when it comes to bringing capital to companies. And also the challenges in bringing opportunity for investment, first for individuals in Haiti, uh, for companies as well, which are uh, sometimes seeking solutions to handle the uh, treasury management and um, last but not least for uh, international investors. And uh, I could start by the Haitian diaspora, but also for uh, investors from the region or for, from uh, elsewhere. Um, and this is uh, one of the reasons why I decided to leave my position as deputy CEO and then the first, the largest Haitian bank and grab the opportunity that came with uh, a change in the legal framework. In 2012, um, the Haitian parliament voted a regulation that for the first time created opportunity to create an investment bank in Haiti. And I found that it was a serious opportunity to do uh, things that was impossible before. Uh, moving toward creating a capital market with all the benefits, obviously all the challenges but with the certainty for us was that capital market is bringing the opportunity to do two major things. Help creating wealth, but also create condition to spread that wealth. Um, obviously, we know Haiti has a significant social gap. You mentioned insecurity, and sometimes we talk about insecurity and we just refer to uh, turmoil in the streets, uh, armed gangs. But um, I, get, I think one of the greatest insecurity is that social gap that is widening day after day and leaves a country with uh, a little grip for uh, people from the community to connect. And we found that investment is one of these ways where not only we can bring the capital from uh, individuals who have the desire to invest in their country, and sometimes they have nowhere else to invest it, uh, but also to bring much needed resources, mostly long-term resources, which are uh, what is mostly needed when you want to invest in sustainable business, business that have the real ability to create added value, whether it's in agriculture, in manufacturing, in tourism. Um, because the financial market was not developed, it left a little way for companies to take some bet on the long term. And this is one of the opportunities that uh, creating an investment bank brought. Finding resources that are, are available, not on a short term, not as a credit line, not just for a business cycle, but for the long term with the ability to uh, face some risk, but also grab some opportunities. And as I said, the second opportunity is that of giving those who, until we came to the market, only had the option of going to a bank and put their money at a rate that is by all means below inflation, rate, whether it's in US dollar or in local currency. And now find the ability 
through uh, mix portfolio uh, and obviously all the techniques that we didn't have as we didn't have a capital market. Now we are showing our customers how to build a portfolio, balance the risk, and build also a future because you got to know that um, we only have a public a pension plan, which is not effective. Uh, most of the money uh, used in uh, allegations is that there, there is a lot of corruption and people getting to retirement have really no option. So capital market is bringing that, that um, dual opportunity, creating uh, the, the, the channel to bring resources on the long-term basis, but creating also the opportunity for investment, first for local, but also uh, paving the way by creating um, structured channels when uh, more structured investors from outside will want to come. And this is also one of the reasons why we created a company which is not only a Haitian based, but also connected with Jamaica, which as you certainly know, is one of the most active uh, financial market in the Caribbean. So we created a company called Caribbean Investor Capital, which is, uh, has uh, subsidiaries in Jamaica, connecting with the Jamaican market, investing in the Caribbean, also a way to diversify risk, but also connecting the channel with some international uh, ways of bringing money. So um, this is what we've been doing for the last eight years. Uh, obviously, there is a long way to go with, but with the support of strong partners, including Haiti Invest, we are one of the portfolio companies of Haiti Invest. Uh, we have, uh, actually, we have sizable results which make us believe that uh, it, it's the way to go. Great. Thank you. Um, oh, actually, Tony is back with us. Thank you. <laughs> Let us, uh, uh, Tony, I just, uh, I think this, this question is still in play, if you don't mind. Um, uh, the question was that I had for you was, you know, the fact that doing business in Haiti is difficult and starting a business dealing with construction permits of registering property can be terribly difficult compared to other other countries. Uh, but it is important for the group, you know, members of the diaspora who have not been here for quite a long time and who might want to invest in the southern part of Haiti where we just had the earthquake. Uh, it is important for them uh, to see, to understand the protections for that, that protections for minority, minority investors might exist. Uh, now, you've been lending to SMEs for decades and we're just asking, you know, what are some of those type of challenges that you see your clients having in this market and what might prevent their expansion? Okay. Uh, thank you guys for having me on this panel. Uh, sorry for this, uh, for those all uh, back and forth uh, um, connections. It's uh, due to, to internet uh, providers. So uh, sorry about that again. So let me first uh, start by giving you a quick, a real quick overview of what Sofides is. Uh, Sofides is a DFI, a Development Finance Institution, created uh, since 1983 now, 38 years. Uh, we are a privately owned company uh, with uh, more than two, 250 shareholders. And the biggest one is, uh, is owning 10% of the capital. So this is a very uh, wide uh, uh, capital spread at Sofides. Our objectives are obviously to finance, not only, not only finance, but supporting SMEs in both uh, financial services and non-financial services. Because be, uh, besides the credit uh, uh, division, we do have also a technical assistance division that provide uh, technical assistance to SMEs in terms of uh, trainings, uh, uh, building business plans, uh, uh, accounting services, uh, stuff like that. Sofides is uh, uh, as a portfolio of about uh, two billion goods. Two billion goods is today 
are almost uh, uh, a little bit more than 20 million US dollars with a balance sheet uh, with a balance sheet of about 44 million US dollars. So this it seems like it's having bandwidth, bandwidth problems. Then let's, let's move on while we wait for Tony again to uh, Andy. Andy, it's such a pleasure to, to have you join us. I know that you know, the DFC has provided guarantees in the past to helping lending institutions reach new, new clients. Actually, even in Haiti, I know if you're in many parts of Africa, but in Haiti too, you, you are here. Now, so my question is, how has the DFC strategy changed over the past year that you know, you've been with them, especially as it relates to Haiti and to similarly challenging environments? Are there any new tools being offered by, by the DFC now? So I think it's helpful to give a little bit of background on, on DFC, which is the U.S. government's new U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, which is the successor entity to two different previous entities, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, OPIC, which was different, and then USAID's Development Credit Authority, which has a long history of doing deals in Haiti. In fact, probably between 2002 and 2007, I worked on the very first loan guarantee transactions in Haiti for USAID when I was a lawyer based out of Santo Domingo. So I'm very familiar with Sophie Dace and Soja Bank and, and Foncoze and all of the banks. And um, what's interesting is as these two different entities have merged, the mandate has changed. OPIC was heavily focused on very, very large transactions, often in upper middle income or even high income countries that were earning a return for the US taxpayer. Whereas the reason behind the creation of DFC was that we wanted to one, take on a bit more risk, but make sure that our lending activities were more highly developmental. Um, focusing in the tougher markets, we have a specific mandate to prioritize investments in low income and lower middle income countries. And when you look at Latin America and the Caribbean, there are only five lower middle income countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, and one of those is Haiti. And so with all of the challenges and the fragility issues in Haiti, we still have this mandate to try to identify and prioritize those types of transactions. So while others may shy away from it, I've been having several calls with people trying to figure out what can we do. And another one of the interesting changes, I mean, we can talk about new tools. One of the new tools now is DFC has the ability to provide some technical assistance, repayable grants, essentially, that are linked to transactions that we do. We also have the ability to make equity investments, but it's a relatively new tool that we're not deploying uh, very heavily. But the biggest change, in my opinion, well, two big changes. One that OPIC had a U.S. nexus requirement, which meant that any investment, any financing that it did, had to have some U.S. investor or connection, whereas when DFC was established, that requirement was removed. There's still a preference, but there's no requirement, which means we can provide direct loans to Haitian companies. Um, we can provide loan guarantees to Haitian companies. Uh, in theory, we could do equity investments to Haitian companies as well. So that's a major, major change. The other major change is that OPIC, as a development finance institution, was designed to live off its proceeds and have like almost like revolve through the money. And so like a lot of the DFIs, they have to earn a return for their shareholder. With DFC, that's not a requirement anymore. We get an annual appropriation from our Congress. And our Congress has said that we just need to determine what the appropriate financial performance of our portfolio is. So what that says to me as a chief development officer is that we've got a lot more room to take on more risk. We're not going to obviously make a lot of bad investments. Our deals are supposed to be commercially viable. Our loans are supposed to be based on commercial viability. But I still, you know, a lot of people like to talk about actual risk and perceived risk. And I, I guess we'll get to this a little bit later. But um, 
I'm dying to try to find more opportunities for DFC to identify transactions in Haiti. So I hope that Jean Marc is and his transaction advisors are bringing us the types of deals that we need. I was gonna, I was going to say that we we've got quite a few for you to take a look at, Andy. So I'll be sure <laughs> to throw it away. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Actually, you know, Jean-Marc, uh, I was going to ask you the, the next question based on your experience in, in Haiti. And it's more specific to a lot of what people think about Haiti sometimes when they first hear of this country or invest in this country, they talk about security. Now, in your, in your experience or in your opinion, how has insecurity affected your work in Haiti and how have you seen insecurity, you know, impact the businesses that you work with? Sure. Um, well, there's no denying it that the the level of insecurity that exists, and as as has been mentioned before, it's not only political insecurity, but it's also economic insecurity. It's also just. Um, uh, Frankly, businesses being unable to plan for the future. I think that's really the, the most difficult part about operating in Haiti is not being able to plan for the future because everything is, um, nothing is a given. Um, so clearly that has an effect um, on the businesses, on their desire to, um, to receive investment capital, uh, their tolerance for risk. And it also has an effect, uh, obviously, on investors. It has an effect uh, with uh, with the local banks uh, in terms of their exposure uh, to the market. And, of course, um, even with impact investors that have a mandate to invest in Haiti, um, they need to approach the, the country cautiously because of this the, the level of, of added insecurity. Um, but what I would highlight, and I think what we've seen um, with the businesses, the SMEs that we've supported, is to a certain extent, the difficult environment um, creates businesses or forces those businesses that, that um, operate in this type of environment to be extremely resilient. Um, they operate in a way where they are uh, calculating all the risks and thinking through because they have experience operating in the market. I'll give you an example. One of the businesses that that we supported, I was talking to the uh, the CEO, and he told me that um, a few years ago, what they decided to do was to get a company van that would pick up all their employees um, and bring them to the office. And they found that this made them much more productive because suddenly they were not um, beholden to strikes or manifestations or, or closures. And they were able to operate. And I think he told me in, in the year where there were quite a few months of manifestations and closures that there were only three business days in which they were unable to operate, which, which is pretty astounding given, um, you know, given what the state of the, the overall political situation was. So that's just one example. But I would say that all these businesses have figured out how to operate in this kind of environment and let's not forget that um, Haiti is a country of 12 million people. There's, there is a need for the services that these businesses provide. So they, they are, they're fulfilling a, a very important function, where they're, whether it's providing energy or water or, or whatever you might think of. These are essential uh, businesses. That's, that's a word that we learned through COVID. But these are all essential businesses in uh, uh, operating there, and they've they've determined ways to deal with that market. So I think it's really for that reason that despite um, despite the fact that we started in 2018, 
and 2019 and 20, 2019 was a difficult year. 2020 was a difficult year um, uh, with, with COVID. Um, we've still been able to see uh, our program generate the type of financing and investment that we we were really hoping for. Now, that's not to say I, I'm sure that had the situation been the macro situation been a little bit um, friendly, uh, we probably would have seen more. But nevertheless, uh, to be able to to see these types of results in a challenging environment, I think speaks to the fact that these um, these are businesses, these are entrepreneurs um, that are very strong in their markets and they're very strong at what they're doing. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to move to back to to Andy, uh, just because we've talked about insecurity, and I want to see it from the viewpoint of the DFC. Uh, and Andy, this is a two part question, if you don't mind. Uh, how does the DFC view insecurity as an you know external investor, and, and the fact that you know. Uh, Despite insecurity in Haiti, what is the opportunity for the DFC and for the the folks that the DFC supports to invest in Haiti? What, what are some of your thoughts on that? So Andy's views on insecurity and DFC's views on insecurity aren't necessarily one and the same. <laughs> and it's because I come from USAID. I worked at USAID for 20 years. And USAID is a grant organization that, you know, essentially disperses billions of dollars a year without the expectation of getting repaid, except for in the case of the former loan guarantee program, which is now part of DFC. So the culture that I come from, and having worked on that DCA, the loan guarantee program, is very different from the culture from what was formerly OPIC and is now DFC. So part of what we're working through is a cultural shift. So we did the first ever development strategy for DFC where we didn't just focus on the amount of money that we're moving and the amount of money that we're dispersing. Because you can say that you've done $8 billion last year in disbursements, but my question is, is well, what have you achieved with that? What's the development output? We're not a commercial bank. So I want to know that there's going to be an output from, from each of these things. And I want to make sure we're taking the appropriate risk because USAID would never go out and brag about spending $8 billion a year. But AID instead would talk about the impact of the money that it's spent. So in our strategy, one of the things that we've done is we've set the goal of making sure that at least 60% of our transactions are in low income, lower middle income, or fragile states. Um, we've done some town halls with Haitian companies to tell them about DFC's tools. So really trying to demonstrate that we're willing to take on more risk. But part of the story that I've told a few times, actually, since I come to DFC, is a story when I presented the first ever loan guarantee deals from USAID to USAID's Credit Review Board from Haiti. And it was in the early 2000s. And people said to me, you know, how can you recommend that we provide loan guarantees in Haiti when there had just been a coup six months ago? And my response to them was, look at the one thing that has been constant in Haiti over the last 50 years. And Tony talked about this, like Sofides has existed since 1983. How many governments have there been in Haiti since 1983? But Sofides continues. And if there's anyone who understands the risks of doing business in Haiti, it's these financial institutions and it's the businesses that continue regardless of which government is in place. And so that's the goal of making sure that people understand the risk, understand the partners, and their tremendous opportunities. And we did those loan guarantees, and they were not problematic at all. So eventually these got, these got approved. So that's part of my, my goal and my mission while I'm at DFC is I really want us to do more in Haiti and, and convince others on our credit committee and our risk folks that this is worth the effort. We don't have to earn a return across the entire portfolio, but we, which allows us to take on more risk. And I actually don't think the risk is as great as people think if you have the right partners. 
Great, great. Thank you so much, Andy. That was that was a, a, a brilliant answer. Uh, uh, you know, you you've set us on the path to the final few minutes. I just want to open this up to the rest of the panel to talk about their vision and and the opportunities that they've seen in in Haiti or, or opportunities that they expect to see in Haiti and now to encourage people. Let us start, uh, Tony. We've not we've not uh, heard that much from you, partly because of uh, interruptions, but. But please, what opportunities, very quickly, do you uh, do you see here in Haiti? Well, I, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. What what opportunities are there uh, for businesses? Yeah, uh, in I, I, I would like to to thank uh, for thank Andy for for mentioning Sophie Des as a partner. <laughs> of course, we are a partner, and we've been managing. Uh, uh, the DCA program, which no longer exists, but uh, uh, but uh, I, I believe it, it it still exists uh, for uh, uh, DFC. Uh, uh, in terms of challenging uh, challenges, uh, besides the constant political turmoil that Robert mentioned, uh, high level of insecurity and also natural disasters. I would like to focus a little bit on uh, a, a lack of qualified human resources. Uh, uh, maybe you, you, maybe you, you know about it. Uh, we in Haiti we have suffered from a quantity of waves of migrants that left Haiti. Uh, since I am a professional. Uh, let, uh, 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 starting in 2000, starting in the 20s, with uh, a first wave uh, going out from Canada, uh, it was a lot of professionals, accountants, engineers, uh, doctors uh, that left the country uh, for Canada, and then we had uh, most recently um, the, the the waves. For for uh, for Latin America like countries like Chile, Brazil, etc., where we had we lost a lot of uh, let's say workers' constructions, ebenists, uh, plumbers. Those are, are people workers that left. Most of them. Uh, SMEs that needs them to 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 keep warning, and then all of a sudden they they, they lost them. And today it's very difficult for my uh, uh, for SMEs to find good employees that can work, and also for for us financial institutions, uh, it's very difficult to have good quality human resources. Robert has a Robert, Robert has, a, has an instinct to find them, but I, <laughs> myself, it's difficult for me. But it's still, we 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 do we do our part, and uh, and we keep doing it as well as we can. This yeah. is this is one thing I, I I wanted to focus on. A, a lot of a, a lot of challenge that we find uh, a little bit difficult to to deal with is. Uh, the the lack of financing i mean for 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 financial institutions like myself since we are not a bank mm -hmm. uh, we we find it sometimes difficult to find uh the good balance in terms of cost of financing mm -hmm. yeah. so we can pass it through our clients at better conditions conditions i, so, I must uh, um, um, uh, tony just just a second there i know i know um, Andy and Jean-Marc, they, you know, those are areas that they definitely are, are specialists in. But, but uh, Robert is the one person who represents the the non-bank financial institution, uh, or at least in in Haiti, in between the two of you. I wanted to, you know, just get his his last um, few words on this discussion on the opportunities that have been available to him and opportunities that he sees available here in Haiti. Uh, just a final word from, from Robert, please. 
Thank you. Um, opportunities, obviously, we've seen uh, many. And um, I definitely have no regrets from, you know, uh, I sometimes I, I, I wish I still was a banker because maybe it's a more <laughs> stable life. But having said that, when we look at uh, what has been created, uh, just to give you a certain sense, back in 2017, we had zero dollar of asset under management. Today, we raised $50 million of money from uh, mostly from people living in Haiti, some from the diaspora, which was raised in Haiti and invested in companies, invested uh, for growth. Um, Aside from this amount, we raised over $25 million of pri uh, money raised for private direct investment in companies. Uh, that's a way to say that, uh, first, there is a base for capital and a desire to invest. And obviously, uh, whichever international investor will look at what is done by local players first. Well, um, and uh, this is why we started by building a, a basis locally. And as we are talking about impact at SOCAP, uh, the very first impact we see and the very first opportunity is that of, of fulfilling that social gap, not by going and um, staying in the aid uh, approach, but by investing, obviously investing with the desire to have capital back, have a decent return, and create um, stability, create wealth, create job creation, create proper behavior uh, at the business level. Because when we invest, we don't only invest money, we come with what we call the smart capital, we come with the assistance, we come with that sense of creating a triple bottom line and bring business closer to the standards of the international world. So I know there are some uh, investors who may think, Haiti, a risk country uh, with a lot of turmoils, um, I would be more than happy to give more details on the return that we've been generating for our investors uh, and how this helped. Uh, booming the, 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 the basis to fight immigration, fight um, lack of, of trust in the country, maintain Haitians where there is an opportunity. Because when you start very low, the potential to grow fast is quite high. So thank you so much. Uh, you know, there's been, uh, like you know, a recent earthquake uh, just in August, and there's a returnee issue. One of the reasons why we went to SOCAP for this uh, event was because it responds to to the earthquake and and to invite investors back or to remind investors, potential investors, about the opportunities in Haiti. I again, I, I'm really grateful and and I'm honored for, for sure to you know, have talk to you, all or four of you gentlemen. Um, Andy, I've admired you, admired you from afar for quite a long time and, and wish you success in your in DFC. Well, I, I don't know if Tony remembers this, but I worked with him on the guarantees back in 2000. Oh, yeah. Of course, and I hope that we had other opportunities to work together again. We do, we do hope so. Hey, Jean-Marc, it's been a pleasure, and I hope that we get to meet in person someday. Uh, Robert, also, uh, you as well. And, and Tony, it's is wonderful to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much, you. everyone. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay, bye.